Idag ska vi prata om solkraft, men inte med vem som helst utan förvaltaren för fonden som presterat bäst de senaste fem åren på Nordnet. Nu sitter jag här med en schweizare. Jag säger varmt välkommen, Pascal Rouchin. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Era. Did uh, I pronounce your name right? More or less. Yes, you did. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we're going to begin straight at it. You are a manager of a solar fund. That uh, name is Luxembourg Active Solar, and it's performing quite well the last five years. Can you tell us shortly about the fund and what you do? Yeah, we manage a fund on the worldwide solar industry. Uh, we started a long time ago, 15 years ago, actually. It was uh, in 2007 that I got the feeling that solar was going to play a major role in the future of energy. So I decided to launch a fund together with a company, but it was way too early because in 2007, the industry was very small. Uh, what year are we in? Sorry. Oh, uh, sorry? Uh, what year? It was 2007. Oh, 2007. Yeah, yeah. 2007, sorry. And, uh, and the fund started in 2008, yes. So we manage this fund on the worldwide solar industry. Uh, to my knowledge, it's the only actively managed uh, fund uh, purely focusing on the solar industry in the world. And uh, you've collected a bunch of companies. I've seen about half of them are American, some are Asian, some are yeah from the all around the world. How do you keep track of all these companies? Well, you know, we've become experts uh, of the solar industry. So, of course, we know all the companies uh, in, the in, in the universe, roughly 90 worldwide. Uh, in the fund, we currently have a bit less, uh, a bit less than 30 uh, holdings. Um, we mm -hmm. invest across the value chain of photovoltaics. So it's everything, not only solar panels, of course, uh, industry to make the panels, so manufacturing the panels. We also have got the polysilicon industry that's needed to, to make the panels. We've got companies installing panels. We've got uh, companies owning and operating the plants. We also have uh, companies manufacturing inverters or other kind of services and products for the solar industry. But it's purely solar. Purely solar. And uh, do you do a due diligence where you go to the different companies and uh, make an analysis? Well, of course, we've got a full uh, investment process, I should say, but we do not go and meet with the companies. And that's a decision we took uh, roughly 10 years ago because we uh, found out that uh, more or less it is... Uh, bringing us a bias to our uh, investment analysis to go and see the companies because you will always see the best plants, so you will always hear the best news, etc., etc. So we work purely with official data, mainly uh, quarterly uh, results. But we also uh, have, of course, a very good top-down knowledge of the solar sector that we could uh, build up over the last 15 years. And we work with uh, a top scientist in the solar industry, Professor Baif, uh, who is heading uh, research for photovoltaics at the Polytechnic School of Lausanne with a big team of more than 100 scientists. And that is really helpful because, of course, we've become experts of solar for many, many things, but for technology, it's not possible. You really need to have a top scientist to understand what's behind the communication of the companies. You mentioned you have a scientist that seems very important to your uh, process. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, he is our technological advisor. Obviously, he's working full time for his research. But uh, we ask uh, Professor Baif every time uh, that a company is communicating on a product that is supposedly better than the other one because you don't understand anything. Uh, and he will tell us if there is an added value or not. And in the past, it proved very useful because uh, the history of the solar industry is, is, is complicated. It's a huge growth, but of course, growth crisis, et cetera, et cetera. And many companies went bankrupt. And some companies went bankrupt because of bad technology. And when you say some companies went bankrupt, some have gone uh, really well. How do you, what's the main difference between that, those that made it well and those that didn't go so well? Is there any characteristics that you found? Yeah, I would say it's, there are many reasons. Uh, what you should know is that in 2011, 2012, there was a, um, um, at the same time, a growth crisis and a price war on solar panels. So there were overcapacity. Uh, the sales prices of solar panels in 2011, 2012 dropped 
It's when the Chinese arrived in Europe. The market was then very small. And uh, this was a big crisis for the industry. So, of course, I mean, uh, then the companies that were a little bit weak on uh, balance sheets or a little bit uh, uh, with an inappropriate strategy or this kind of companies, I mean, they, they went down after uh, this crisis. You always hear that uh, solar panels have been cheaper and cheaper, which people say is a very good thing because now we can produce more energy for a less cost. But at the same time, could that hurt the companies that produce these panels that they are getting cheaper and cheaper? Yes, it's exactly what happened, uh, let's say, between uh, 2005, that is really the beginning of the industry, and 2020 uh, or 2018. Uh, so uh, the cost of generating electricity with uh, solar was divided by 10 in 10 years. So roughly between 2010 and 220, divided by 10. So not only the panel, the panel was divided by more than that. I'm, I'm talking about everything. I mean, because you need to install the panels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and now it, it has become the cheapest source of electricity in most countries without subsidies. I'm talking below four cents per kilowatt hours and the best plants in the world, they would already generate electricity in the range of like two cents or below per kilowatt hours. And that's a world record. There's never been electricity generated that cheap from whatever source of electricity. So you see it went down a lot, but now that solar is the cheapest, now margins go up and companies make money. But of course, in the process of getting competitive, it was super difficult for the industry. That is why our fund for the first 10 years performed only, I would say, downwards. Uh, we started roughly 10 years too early. But then afterwards, as you mentioned, over the last five years, we did extremely well. And speaking of doing extremely well, it really was 2020 where your fund skyrocketed. What happened that year? Well, that year is a COVID year, so it started uh, not so well because, as you remember, there was a COVID crash. So everybody went into the crash, so did we. But we did already quite good because we've got high beta stocks. So normally, when there's a crash, you should lose much more than the market. We did not. We lost like the Dow Jones, roughly. And then there was a huge run, and uh, we ended up 220 uh, with a performance uh, of almost... Uh, multiplying uh, the fund by three. Um, so what did happen? Well, in 2020, uh, at the beginning of the COVID crisis, many countries injected billion into the economy in order to avoid a recession. And some of the money went into the energy transition. So that is why. So of course, it was an exceptional year. But stocks, when I mean, when stocks go up a lot, even though it was not a bubble, I insist on that, it was not a bubble. But even when stocks go up, a lot sometimes and all the time I would say they need to correct and consolidate. It's exactly what happened over the last two years. We just had two years of uh, consolidation um, and that is very good but it also means that uh, our stocks and the fund uh, got much cheaper because over the last two years um, uh, profits and revenues of the companies were roughly multiplied by two. And uh, here in Sweden, a lot of people are uh, adopting these uh, solar panels on their own roofs or on their apartment roofs and such things. Uh, but there must be a huge potential in even warmer countries like Italy or uh, maybe Switzerland, where you're from. Uh, at the same time, we have an energy crisis. Do you view the solar panels as uh, the solution to the energy crisis here in Europe? It is uh, the solution, yes, together with uh, the wind farm, absolutely. And it's not my opinion, it's everybody's opinion in the energy industry and also the politicians agree with that. So now it's very clear and if you look at the strategy of EU to free itself from the dependency towards Russian gas, uh, it's called Repower EU. It's very clear that it is solar and wind that will bring independence in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, so to, ju just to give you a few uh, data points, I mean, solar is developing everywhere, uh, but this year, and, and the, mar the market is growing uh, at, at a very high pace. So this year we expect 350 gigawatt of new installations in the world. One gigawatt is about the size of a large nuclear reactor. So you see, it's a lot. Actually, the solar panels to be installed this year in the world, they are enough to power a country like Germany. That's only the additions of this year. But still, 
I mean, still solar, it's quite small if you compare it to worldwide electricity generation. Last year, it was 5%, a bit more in Europe, 7.2%, but moving very fast. So if you look at expectations, for example, from the International Energy Agency, uh, they say that we should be around 20% by 230 worldwide. I think it will be higher in the range of 23 to 25%. So you see moving from 5% of worldwide electricity generation to 25% in like eight years is not a small thing. It's a true revolution that's happening in the energy sector. Uh, in Sweden, at least, it's a very big debate about the, the energy because uh, some people talk about opening uh, new nuclear, uh, other people uh, talk about uh, wind and solar. And there's also a question about predictability. You know, wind sometimes generate a lot, sometimes not so much, but our uh, need is quite constant. How do you deal with the predictability? Okay, it is true. I mean, we are uh, potentially heading into a world that will be like half solar, half wind. And it sounds a bit crazy, or at least it sounded uh, crazy uh, 10 years ago, but now I would say it's in the book. It's even been modelized for uh, Europe. How would it work? Half wind, half solar. Well, it does, but of course you need to adapt uh, a bit the grid. And so there should be more storage. Storage nowadays is mainly made with uh, big dams, mostly in the Alps, right? Where you can potentially also pump back the water in the dam. But nowadays, if you look at large solar farms in the world, well, one out of two is being coupled with batteries. So of course, of course, lots uh, of batteries are, are, are going to be installed in order to be, man to be able to manage the grid. But it's only part of the story. Because actually, if you think uh, decarbonization, uh, you probably know that in order to decarbonize the economy, you must electrify the economy. So it means we're using, we will use electricity for everything, not only for the grid and for what we do today, but for transportation, for heat through heat pumps. Uh, so it means we will need much more electricity than the grid. So basically, uh, what I'm saying here is we will need a much higher um, daily production of electricity than the grid is needing. So basically, uh, the fluctuation above here is only going to hit uh, uh, grid demand for some time, not all the time. So basically, we need like a surplus constantly, and that surplus is the margin of error. Exactly, it's what's going to happen. And when you have too much, you will charge batteries, you will transform electricity into hydrogen that you can use later, for example, transform it into synthetic fuels for the plane, for the lorries, use it for the lorries uh, or for the shipping industry. You can, uh, tr you can use hydrogen for heavy industry like cement and steel. Uh, you see, uh, so there are other applications that will be made with electricity that are not directly uh, linked to the grid, I would say. Then you talked about a bit about uh, it's not uh, in need of any subsidizing. Do, uh, is it important that uh, we still have governments that help these projects or are they going to stand alone and do fine just the market by itself without government interference? Solar is clearly now the cheapest source of electricity without subsidies. But I must tell you that, of course, when you talk energy, you talk uh, energy policy because there's almost no country without any, any laws or, or, or regulatory environment on, 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 on the energy, right? And everything that's been put in place, well, was put in place 30, 50 years ago for the old world of energy, for fossil fuels, basically. So these guys have got huge advantages, mostly put in law. That is why you need to help uh, the new ones, solar and wind, at least to levelize up with what the others have, you see. So the question of subsidies is a diff difficult question because you need to look at every country individually, but globally, uh, globally renewable, uh, renewable energy is much, much less subsidized than fossil fuels. When you talk about you need to level up the plane with the fossil fuels, what exactly do you mean? Well, I mean that uh, subsidies for fossil fuels are very big. I can take the example of the USA, where uh, production of electricity uh, with um, gas and coal have been subsidized for uh, dozens of years. 
so currently in the USA, if you look at the solar industry, they would enjoy a uh, tax credit of uh, 30%, so it looks like a subsidy, but actually it's no more than what the fossil fuel industry is enjoying. That is why uh, the easy way to conclude is to say, no, there's no more subsidies, or at least we do not need subsidies anymore, but we need a fair regulatory environment in every country. And actually it's coming, obviously, because now it's, it's a top priority uh, almost in every country in the world, uh, to uh, reduce pollution uh, and to uh, decarbonize the economy. And you are an investor that uh, you talked about that you also invest in different parts of the supply chain, not only the panels by itself uh, in other companies. Uh, can you tell us about what's the risk and the reward of the different parts of the supply chain? Yeah, it's uh, kind of uh, different across the supply chain, uh, but it moves uh, it moves around uh, um, with time. I mean, it's not always been more risky here or less risky there. But I can still tell you that, of course, uh, the companies manufacturing the panels used to have a hard time because they are the one facing competition. They are the one that need to be cheaper when they compete. Uh, in, an, uh, in an auction uh, where everybody competes, uh, wind, gas, and coal, well, they are the ones that need to be the cheaper. You know, that is why uh, they suffered uh, during the first 10 years, let's say, uh, to become competitive. So margins there uh, used to be quite low, but now they are going up. Uh, otherwise, you can see better margins uh, in companies manufacturing inverters, uh, or other kind of equipment players. Uh, it's also a good business to own and operate the solar plants, etc., etc. And if we look at those that produce the solar panels, would it be correct of me to assume that a lot of that is produced in China? Yes, it's correct. 75% roughly of the solar panels are produced in China currently. And is that uh, a risk, a political risk? It sounds like it, and if you read the papers or listen to the politicians, it sounds like it. In my opinion, it is not. And the reason is because you need to know what you need to make a solar panel. And uh, you need polysilicon. What is the raw material? Well, the raw material is a kind of sand that is called quartz sand, available everywhere on Earth, and that costs almost nothing. And it's, it's available in very large quantities, roughly one third of the Earth's crest. So a solar panel is pretty much 99.9% .9 sand. So what it means is the Chinese, I, I mean, the, the industry just consolidated in China uh, for, for many reasons uh, on, due, due to the history of the industry and, 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 and the growth crisis, I would say. But it's not like China has got the leverage on us with that because it would be absolutely it wouldn't make sense for them to stop selling the panels to Europe or the USA you know they will just destroy their own industry we will build our own and by the way as you know it's now it's now the strategy of uh, Europe and the USA to try and bring back as much manufacturing not only for solar but for everything bring back manufacturing uh, home but uh, it, it will happen but it will take time do you have any stock that is a play on uh home shoring that uh, brings back production of solar here to Europe. Yes, yeah, there is one stock. Uh, it's a Swiss company called uh, Meyer Burger and they, will, uh, they are actually producing uh, solar panels uh, in Germany. Uh, the company has got a very long story. It changed business models uh, basically uh, three times and that is the last chance. And, and this is a really good chance because obviously um, politicians would like to have some uh, let's say homemade products. But in my opinion, this is not that important. What's important is that solar panels are installed in every country in the world where they will generate electricity. This is the point, you see. And there's still lots of added value into installations. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of people in the world installing solar panels. Uh, and looking at the uh, different countries, would you say that uh, Southern Europe is the first to large-scale adopt this because of uh, the sun time, or do you see that uh, it does not correlate with uh, how efficient the solar panels will be? 
Yes, it does correlate uh, because, of course, a solar panel in Madrid is going to uh, generate more electricity than in Stockholm. Uh, but uh, nowadays, I mean, in the in the past, you you've seen Germany being very big uh, from the beginning because they had some good incentives. Uh, but I would say uh, it's competitive uh, all over uh, the world, uh, and uh, demand is really being pushed uh, by the base, I would say by the people or by the industry, you know. Now in Europe, uh, so many people would like to free themselves from, from the crazy electricity tariffs that are asked uh, by the utilities, right? So everybody would like to have solar panels on the roof. Same for corporations. Every industry would like to have solar panels on the roof or sign power purchase agreement with a large solar plant for a fixed price. But do you see those kind of investments happening in, for example, in Madrid, that you see large-scale adaptation of uh, solars? Yes, absolutely. It's happening in uh, Spain. Spain is uh, uh, the biggest market uh, together with Germany nowadays, uh, installing this year probably between 8 and 10 gigawatt in a single year. So it means Spain and Germany will install in a single year the equivalent of 8 to 10 large nuclear reactor. And if you look at Europe as a whole, we're talking 70 gigawatt of new installation this year. So you see it's moving very fast. I told you at the beginning, Europe last year generating 7.2% 7, 7 of electricity with solar. Next year, I think we're going to cross already the 10% line. And by 2030, most probably in Europe, solar is going to be in the range of 25 to 30% and wind pretty much the same. So you will have large majority of electricity coming from renewables. And which companies do you think will uh, gain the most from this development? Well, the good thing is now the industry and the technology are mature. And as uh, solar has become super competitive, I mean, uh, there's no reason for one, reason of the one part of the value chain to lose money. So they are all making money. Every part of the value chain is making money, and that might come as a surprise uh, for investors because it used to be a loss-making industry. It's not true anymore. So there is enough margin for everybody, but of course margins might move around the value chain over time. But since they uh, previously didn't make money, are they leveraged now? High leveraged? Not that much because they are time to uh, take uh, the debt down. They had roughly 10 years. I mean, the high leverage uh, was in the years uh, 2012, 2013. So over the last 10 years, the debt was taken down. And the only companies with uh, high debt are the one uh, owning uh, the solar plants. And that's kind of logical because we're talking long-term long -term infrastructure that will produce electricity for 40, 50 years. So the debt, the debt is directly linked to these uh, solar farms. So that's not an issue, actually. But at the same time, we see higher interest rates all across uh, Europe and the US. Uh, doesn't that hurt the, the investments because their financial cost is going up? It doesn't really, because when you think about uh, new uh, power capacity, it's always a lot of money. I mean, be it uh, solar, wind, gas or coal. So, I mean, you need uh, investment for all of these. So, I mean, it's the same. And I would like to add as well that uh, for the solar industry, actually, of course, interest rates have gone up for everybody, but risk premiums have gone down massively for the solar industry, meaning we're coming from a world where uh, banks looked at solar investment as something uh, risky or a little bit new, etc. So they ask for a high risk premium. And now they see it as mainstream and they absolutely want to finance. So, of course, risk premium went down. And do you yourself, uh, when you look at these types of companies, do you view those with low leverage as uh, good companies to do M&As? And is that a big part of the consolidation story? Yeah, but the, the industry pretty much already consolidated. So I'm not going to say that there won't be any more M&As or things like that, but I would say uh, that's one of the key arguments uh, to invest today. Everything is mature, the technology, the industry, the markets. So there might be some M&As, but uh, we're not seeing uh, a lot. Uh, it's maybe one per year. There is a few IPOs as well, but it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's already consolidated. 
Hallåj! Har ni koll på Nordnets Private Banking erbjudande? Ni som är Private Banking kunder på Nordnet får förmånlig kortage, kanoner med handaktier och även förmånlig utlåningsränta. Men utöver detta får man även förmånlig sparränta på ISK, kapitalförsäkring eller sparkonto. Men hur blir jag Private Banking kund? Först och främst, det här är en helt gratis tjänst. Och det du behöver är att samla ett sparande på 2,5 miljoner kronor. Och i de här 2,5 miljoner kronorna kan du till exempel stoppa in din tjänstepension. Vilket kan underlätta för många att komma upp över gränsen. Så in på Nordnet, kolla in vår Private Banking erbjudande och lika till! And now I just want to hear about you. You said that you were 10 years too early. Uh, more or less. How was those 10 years too early for you? It was very difficult because uh, we launched uh, the solar fund actually uh, on the exact day where Lehman went bankrupt. That was the oh. 15th of September 2008, yeah. And uh, we decided uh, it, it's uh, reasonable to invest a full portfolio in three weeks and the financial crash came on week four. So, I mean, more unlucky you cannot be. We started with minus 75%. Um, and then uh, there was uh, uh, the solar crisis or the growth crisis I mentioned earlier in 2011, 2012, where absolutely nobody wanted to invest in a solar stock, so we lost pretty much everything. Um, and later on, there was something that has no, nothing to do with solar. There was the oil crashing from 100 to 20 in the years 2016, 17, um, and and we we got impacted by the. I would say is a bad momentum on stock market for everything energy. So it was very bad from 2008 to 2018, I would say, 10 bad years. Uh, but at the same time, solar got much, much cheaper and the market got much, much bigger. So it was kind of obvious to us that we were going in the right direction. That's why, I mean, we 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 kept doing what we were doing and we kept believing more than ever that solar will one day change the world of energy, and that is exactly what it is doing today. But did you never feel during that time that you wanted to change uh, to another fund or do something else because it's... No, I never wanted to stop. But sometimes I thought about uh, how would I uh, do to pay my bills? Uh, I mean, how, how could I get some extra money, you see? But otherwise, I never wanted to stop the fund. Uh, my worst case scenario was to close down the company and, and, and place the fund in another company where I would be able to manage the, keep managing the fund until it gets better. But we did, did not have to resort to that. So we could, we could, we could survive, I should say. Uh, and now it's becoming a, a good business with the energy transition that is finally becoming a reality. I would like to tell you something I didn't tell uh, you yet that yeah. is really striking. And nobody knows that. It's hard data. If you look at every new power installations installed in the world today, what I'm saying today is this month, this year, 60% of that is solar, 60%. So it's amazing and nobody knows that. Uh, so it, then you can see that it's really leading the energy transition. And of course, it's very important for investors because once you know solar is not a small player anymore, on the contrary, has become the leader of the power sector in terms of new installation, well, then it does make sense to have a clean exposure in your portfolio on solar with a solar fund. But with you, is it purely investment and on a financial standpoint, or do you personally uh, feel invested in uh, the solar story? Yeah, I mean, it's my life, I would say, my professional life. I used to be chief risk officer of a utility, so I was already, uh, I mean, in the, in, the, in the power sector before, but then I, I got this idea, so it, it, it's become, uh, it's become my, my entire professional life. Um, and I'm not only convinced uh, that solar is a good thing, but of course I was worried about climate change and uh, hoping that things would change fast. And I, I mean, one one way out is clearly uh, the solar energy. It's kind of obvious. Uh, it's been known actually for 50 years, but I mean, it took a lot of time to, 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 to come to uh, reality as we are today. Do you have solar panels on your own roof? Yes, I do. Uh, in my house uh, in uh, Lausanne, uh, where we have uh, three uh, apartments with three families uh, uh, with uh, solar panels only on the thousand roof we generate more electricity that we need over a year uh, 
and all of this makes me think uh, that, all right, this is, we talked about Europe, we talked about uh, the US to some extent, uh, but how about the more poor countries, say North Africa? We've always heard a story about if you place solar panels on the Sahara Desert, uh, but the problem is it's a cost thing. Does the cheaper uh, price of producing energy in solar mean that there is a bigger market in emerging markets like Morocco or Algeria or yeah, Egypt? No, that was a very old idea of the utilities, uh, al almost a fake plan, I would say, to say, okay, let's put solar panels over there, bring back electricity. <laughs> Nobody wants to do that, also for geopolitical reasons. So the story of solar is really the story of decentralization of electricity generation. Everybody should generate electricity on its rooftop, same for the industry, etc., etc. But so I it's mean, everywhere. But I mean, isn't the cheaper prices making it accessible for uh, poorer countries like Egypt to produce their own solar? Isn't oh, yes, yeah, so of yeah. course. I mean, Egypt will produce its own solar. That's obvious. I mean, and, and every, everybody will produce its own. But I mean, they are not going to export. Uh, there might be some exceptions, like there is one big uh, project in Australia, uh, northern Australia, a uh, gigawatt scale project, uh, a solar project, uh, where the idea is to transform the electricity into hydrogen and to, and to transport it through a pipeline to uh, Singapore. So this is to some extent possible. But I would say otherwise, the idea is uh, it should be everywhere. And you mentioned the USA and Europe, but of course Ch I should mention China because China is the biggest market. I mean, China is installing in the range of 120 gigawatts this year alone. So you see, and India is big as well in the range of 30 to 40 gigawatts per year. The US, we're, we haven't talked enough about the US because it's a huge market and a lot of your investments are in the US, at least in US stocks. Uh, how is the market looking there and is it a bit more political uh, in the US? It's a bit more political for obvious reason. Uh, of course, uh, you see the uh, trade tension uh, or geopolitical tension with uh, China. And uh, as most panels are made in China, and then they got uh, taxed uh, when they are imported, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's the reason why the U.S. market kind of slowed down last year with only roughly 20 gigawatt of new installation. But this year, the market could potentially double 40 gigawatt, and in the next coming years, install more than 50, 60 gigawatt per year. It's to do with the Inflation Reduction Act that the Congress enacted last year. It's called inflation. It's nothing to do with inflation. Actually, it's the biggest piece of legislation on renewables, planning to uh, invest roughly 370 billion into the energy transition. So yes, the US is becoming a very big market. And actually, it should be bigger without all these uh, trade hindrance that the government is putting. It should be bigger because, like in Europe, every citizen or every corporation would like to install solar panels. So actually in the US, uh, demand is higher than supply. But you uh, also told me that uh, it's not that difficult to produce uh, the solar panels and it's quite easy to produce it at a uh, level pace with China in any part of the world. How about homeshoring in uh, the US? Isn't there any player that can... Yes, bring... it's starting. Yeah? It's starting. But actually, if you look at the uh, three biggest announcements of a manufacturing uh, plant for solar in the US over the last six months, they were all made by Chinese companies. <laughs> so Chinese companies are setting up subsidiaries in the US to produce uh, solar panels. But the US government doesn't mind because the jobs will be over there, you see. But I think they are too focused on the jobs. As I said before, most importantly is the electricity, the power, where do you generate it? Well, they should install much, much more, so they should make it easier for solar panels to be imported. But I mean, it's the way it is. Could you uh, pick uh, one or two stocks that are based in the US that you find extra interesting right now? Based in the US, yeah. I think. Um, there would be Enphase Energy. Enphase Energy is a company um, manufacturing inverter. Uh, the inverter is the key machine that you need for every solar installation. I mean, it's transforming electricity that's coming out of the panel, that is continuous current into alternative current, but it's doing some other thing. Basically, it's a smart link between uh, the solar uh, installation and, and, and the grid. 
that would be a, a, a good company, though it's not in our top five because uh, we think the risk return profile is, is, is not uh, at its best, I, w- I should say. Uh, I could mention uh, Canadian Solar, but it's a half Chinese, half Canadian company. It's one of the leaders of uh, solar panel manufacturing. Uh, it's a big company very, with a very good technology. And like most of these large solar panel companies, they would also compete for large solar farm and install the farms and sometimes uh, keep the solar farm on the balance sheet like uh, Canadian Solar is doing it. So you've got part of the balance sheet that is really owning and operating the solar farm so that will generate electricity and, and uh, recurring uh, cash flow. But you know, as, as, a general, as a generality, I do not like to talk too much about stocks because if you look at the history of the solar sector, well, lots of people lost all their money because they bet on one, two, three of the leaders in the past and most of the past leaders went bankrupt. So what I'm saying here, as much as the risk on the big story I'm talking moving from 5% of electricity generation to 25% in 230 and higher afterwards. Afterwards, As much the risk on the big story is almost nil or very small because, I mean, we clearly see the energy transition is moving on. As much there are risk within the companies, that's obvious. And that's our job to pick the right one, to put the right weight at the right moment and to give a nice exposure on the full industry worldwide. And uh, finally, I've talked to a lot of, uh, actually, uh, raw material producers that always say that the solar is good for them because it requires more um, uh, material and such things. Uh, But does that also not uh, produce a component risk? We've seen uh, semiconductors with the car industry and other things. Is there like a risk for components in uh, the solar sector? Not really. I mean, you only need uh, semiconductor chips for inverter. So yes, there was a little bit of an issue over the last two years. Uh, but otherwise, as I said, the solar panel is almost 100% sand, but a little bit of something else that is silver. If you look at the solar panel, the gray lines on it, it's silver. Uh, currently, the solar industry is already using 15% of the silver uh, production. So it's a lot. And I mentioned earlier, or I did not, I don't remember, uh, the mar- solar market will double and be multiplied oh, by yeah. four, be four to 30. So how is it going to go with silver? Well, of course, the industry is going to save. Probably it's possible to save half the quantities they use now over the next five years, let's say. But then there might be an issue, but we already know there's a, an answer to that. And the answer is substitution. So silver is going to be substituted by copper. We know it's working. But of course, the industry will do it if they must, so it will take, I mean, several years, probably nothing is going to happen in the next five years. And once uh, solar panels are made uh, with silver, then there's absolutely zero issue on raw materials because the solar market will then be a very, very small part of the copper uh, market. Does that mean that you are, to some extent, short-term bullish on the silver? Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, but uh, we're not betting on that. I mean, we've, we've got enough to invest uh, within the solar industry, I would say. Uh, finally, I usually like to ask my guest this final question. If you can pick one event that you think is going to happen this year that's most exciting for you, what do you hope for and uh, what do you think it is? Anything. Yeah, I don't really have an event in mind, I would, uh, because of, you know, there are these uh, climate uh, conference uh, every year and some are bigger than others. Uh, I think this year is in uh, Saudi Arabia, so I do not expect uh, anything super big. Uh, Lots of things happened in the past already uh, with the G7 last year uh, targeting 100% Decarbonize electricity by 235, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I think I would, I would rather like uh, the geopolitical tension uh, between China and the USA to go down. Because anyway, it's not good for us, but it's not good for anybody, I believe. <laughs> and uh, so that would be a good piece of news. And actually, it's one of the reasons why uh, our stocks are so cheap today. Uh, because because lots of them are listed in the USA, even though they are active on the worldwide uh, solar market. 
And U.S. investors uh, have become a little bit uh, worried on all these uh, China-U.S. Uh, tensions. So I'd be happy that this would uh, ease down a bit. So does that mean that you see a discount in the U.S., a perceived discount in the U.S.? Oh, yes. I mean, uh, most of our stocks are currently, I would say, too cheap because of the feeling of U.S. investors, you know, that uh, it's difficult with China. Pascal, it's been a delight to have you here uh, to talk about uh, this industry. I've learned so much in such a short time. It's uh, truly been a delight. Can Thank I tell you, for... you one more thing? Oh, yeah. I'd like to tell you, do you know what is the main difference between fossil fuels and renewables? The carbon dioxide? Could be, <laughs> but uh, there is a key difference. Is that for uh, renewables, well, the fuel is free. Nobody can make you pay for the sun or the wind. Mm. And that is changing the full dynamics of the energy market, you see? Because up to now, we're only talking the price of oil, gas, and coal. So in the future, not only will energy be abundant, will most countries will become independent, but energy will also be very cheap and without volatility. Because volatility is not going to be brought by the machines, by the solar panels or the wind turbines, you see? So it's going to be a totally different new world of energy with, of course, geopolitical implications. And I think we will see that very clearly in the next 10 to 15 years. I really look forward to it. Uh, my parents are from uh, the Kurdish part of Iraq. And since I've been born and visiting there, they always say that in a couple of years, we'll solve the electricity problem. And to this day, half the day they are without electricity. So I really look forward <laughs> to solar solving that. Uh, Pascal, thanks for being here. Och vi spar på den kommer såklart vara tillbaka även nästa vecka. Missa inte oss då på återseende. Tyckte ni om detta? Glöm inte att ge oss en tumme upp och prenumerera. Och dessutom, vill du se mer så har vi fler videor här borta. Klicka! <laughs>